Thank you very much. I'm honored by this award. Um, like anything worthwhile in life, I had a lot of help getting here. And before getting to the subject matter, I want to run through a few slides to acknowledge people, or at least groups of people, that directly or indirectly had a hand in this. Some of these you may have a little trouble reading. I apologize in advance. It's going to be quick and impersonal. But what I need to do is acknowledge mentors that go back to the Tennessee Department of Conservation, my alma mater, Austin P., uh, the Nature Conservancy, mentors at Texas A&M, present and previous BYU presidents, college deans, museum directors, and department chairs. Also in that list, 15 current and former graduate students, eight current or former postdoctoral associates, five undergraduate students completing honors projects, 10 current undergraduate mentees, nine current or previous short-term or sabbatical visitors, 11 colleagues that don't fit into other categories, and finally, the BYU Systematics Discussion Group. My in-laws, Robert and Margaret Lawson of Trenton, Kentucky, have given me nothing but love and support the whole time I've been uh, connected with their family. My own family consists of a younger brother who's taking this picture, three younger sisters, parents who provided, uh, again, nothing but love and support. My younger brother, Cliff, and I spent a lot of time hunting and fishing in our preteen and teen years. This is him with a hawk we nursed back from a gunshot wound. My best mentor was my dad. He took me at a very early age uh, into the woods and onto the rivers and lakes. He was active in scouting, hunting, and fishing. So I, I grew up thinking that this was normal, and I'm fortunate to almost be making a living by my hobby right now. This is him showing my daughter the proper way to clean a fish. Uh, my childhood was different, and if my parents ever worried about it, they kept it in secret, like, oh, I hope he grows out of this. Didn't happen. I had nothing but encouragement and support. Finally, to Joanne, this award is a big measure part due to her, uh, not just support, but active participation in a lot of the research. And our daughter, Hillary, this is her at age two in southern Utah. She's 21 now. Um, both of them together have made made this whole thing really a family affair. What I thought I would do in the time I have is briefly introduce you, first of all, to herpetology. This is the biology of amphibians and reptiles. Herpeton means to creep. These are the things that crawl on the ground. In the interest of time, I'm going to leave out the amphibians and focus on reptiles only. Uh, this is a, a phylogenetic uh, tree of our current understanding of the evolutionary relationships of these groups. Don't worry about the unpronounceable names, but everything in the blue square there is part of a living group of reptiles. The red at the top are the turtles. They're the oldest living group. I'll just walk through the turtles, then the crocodilians grouped in the b green square at the bottom. Genealogically, they're closer to birds than they are to any of the other living reptiles. And all the stuff in between, the squamates, the scaly reptiles, those are lizards and snakes. Just a few things about their biology, a little bit about some of our research. Turtles are unmistakable. You all know what these are. They're characterized by dermal bony armor. There's just under 300 species in the world. I want to focus on a couple of things. One, their longevity. You're looking at a pair of green sea turtles I photographed in Hawaii. Uh, these turtles and a few others are renowned for their migratory abilities. This is an example of a green turtle colony that nests on a tiny little island called Ascension Island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Those same turtles as adults feed off the coast of Brazil. But at nesting time, the adult females migrate in group and find their way across 1,400 miles of featureless open ocean to find a two-mile wide island in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, we know they're nearsighted. They're not coming up out of the water and looking at the stars. Uh, they're navigating by the Earth's geomagnetic field. It's like they've got a compass hardwired into the brain. They come to the island. They assemble in mass. They emerge at night in mass, lay eggs, go back into the sea, young hatch, go back into the sea, and they don't mature for 20 or 25 years. So turtles are difficult to study. They live a long time. Uh, some undertake long migrations, and they, and they can potentially roam over vast areas. We're working on a turtle in the Amazon basin that has properties similar to sea turtles. This is a freshwater turtle. Portuguese term for it is tartaruga. And it, uh, it lives in the Amazon basin. This is a photograph of an Amazonian tributary from a small airplane. 
The Amazon responds to two seasons, wet and dry, and river levels may rise and fall up to 12 meters in response to the wet and dry season. At the peak of the dry season, uh, the rivers leave exposed beaches on both banks, and this big turtle uh, assembles in mass at selected beaches. We don't know the cues they use to decide which beach to nest on, but they assemble, pile up for a few days, then at night usually they come up on the beach, lay eggs. This is what a turtle beach looks like the next day. The open craters here are unused body pits. If a turtle puts eggs in the bottom of a pit, it covers it up and looks like this. Then the female makes her way back to the river the next morning. This is usually an exhausting all-night affair. About 80 days later, the eggs begin to hatch in a chamber in the bottom of this pit. The young dig their way up through a meter of sand uh, and then literally run for the water's edge because they've got to get through a gauntlet of predators that have accumulated on the beach in anticipation of the big hatch. When they get to the water, they're still not safe. There are large predatory fishes they also have to avoid. Uh, and if they manage to get away from both sets of predators, they enter the Amazon basin somewhere at the beginning of the rainy season. The rivers come up, maybe 10 or 12 meters, flood out into a type of forest called varzea, flooded forest, and we don't know where they go and we don't know how long it takes them to attain maturity, but someday they'll emerge as adults back on these beaches. Uh, this is a map of the Amazon basin giving you some idea. If an animal lives 20 or 25 years, it can roam potentially anywhere in a watershed about the size of Australia. So it's not easy to figure out where they go and what they do. And the reason this is important is that there's a human component to the to turtle population dynamics now. There are people who live on these rivers. Uh, this is a photograph of a village on an Am Amazonian tributary. The, this particular culture is referred to as caboclo. These are people of mixed Indian and Portuguese descent. And they rely very heavily among other things, on turtles for protein, both meat and eggs. And so uh, the, the best kind of turtle to look for is a real big one that nests in colonies. Then you've got a whole lot of protein concentrated in one place. And if you know where that place is and go there at the right time of the year, it's easy to harvest adult females. But they can be over-harvested. Uh, and the conservation agencies in Brazil are concerned about this. They've had protective efforts in place since the late 70s. And one thing they can do is safeguard the beaches during the nesting season. This is a turtle beach, and if you can see the little white stakes in the sand there, every stake marks an active nest. They've learned, among other things, that in any given year, a certain number of nests are completely lost due to natural causes. This particular nest was laid too close to the river and got waterlogged. Well, this is, this is a nest that could be harvested. A family could dig up and take the whole clutch here at no impact to the population. What's difficult to know is how to, how to establish a harvest level that allows sustainability of the population. And if you, if you know almost nothing about the animal, you're kind of in the dark trying to do this. Well, one thing that can be done is uh, one can use genetic markers to figure out some aspects of the migration routes and the life history features. We're collaborating with two groups at two different universities in Brazil and in other Amazonian countries. This map shows the distribution of major nesting sites that are protected, and we're getting tissue samples and following marine turtle biologists trying to use genetic markers to address some basic ecological questions. We don't have 20 or 30 years to wait to get the ecological data by tagging females. We're trying to use genes to take a shortcut here. Uh, the answers will be forthcoming in a year or two. This is work that's still in progress. Um, they should be very interesting and very useful to conservation and management of this big river turtle. Let me switch briefly to a completely different group now, the crocodilians, 23 living species, not very many, but they're, they're unmistakable in their biology, their morphology. They're all covered with dermal bony armor, big broad heads. This is an Indo-Pacific crocodile in Australia. This is the largest living reptile in body mass. It can grow to 21 feet and weigh a ton. Crocodilians that size are formidable predators. They've all got conical pointed teeth. They feed in the water by ambush, and they're capable of taking very large prey items, uh, which means if you spend time in crocodile country, you have to be aware of the potential dangers. Nothing to be afraid of, but there's a difference between fear and respect. They do need to be respected. But they have very interesting uh, sociobiology. I mentioned that their closest living relatives were birds. 
Crocodilian males stake out territories and they sing like birds, only the song is a bellow. It's not really a, a song, but it's the crocodilian equivalent of bird song. They pair up, they build a nest with sticks, they incubate eggs in a nest. When the eggs hatch, the parents pick up the baby crocs in the teeth, carry them to the water's edge, and then guard them for a time there. That's fairly sophisticated social behavior by reptile standards. A number of these are endangered due to overhunting, and one of the most endangered is this one, the Orinoco crocodile, which is an inhabitant of the Llanos of Venezuela and Colombia. In Venezuela, this species has been reduced to three very tiny isolated populations, and there is active interest in Venezuela in not only conserving those populations, but augmenting them and repatriating the Orinoco crocodile back to part of its former range. Uh, we're peripherally involved in this project right now. There is a very active captive breeding program, but it has no genetic component. So the people in Venezuela doing the captive breeding don't know the sources of their animals or the relatedness of their animals, and our job is to secure money to uh, implement a genetics program to overlay on the captive management program for repatriation of the Orinoco crocodile. Well, this proposal's been submitted. We'll know in a couple of months if this goes through, we'll be plugged into a very exciting project. I'll be looking for some undergraduates that, are, that have good reflexes. <laughs> okay, squamata, the scaly reptiles, lizards and snakes. In contrast to the other two, this group is very large, 7,000 plus species, more being described every year. All are characterized by epidermal scales that are periodically shed. And the group ranges from very small lizards like this eastern skink to lizards that can weigh two or three hundred pounds and be dangerous to humans. This is the Komodo dragon of Indonesia, world's largest lizard. In between those two extremes, there is a remarkable array of morphological and ecological diversity. There are, for example, lizards in Central America that can run bipedally across the water. There are lizards in Southeast Asia with extended ribs that catch a membrane and allows the lizards to jump out of trees and parasail to other trees. Here's a good one. Uh, there are lizards in Western United States, including Utah, uh, that are all female. There are four species I'm showing here of a lizard called a race runner. The two on the left, A and C, are normal bisexual species. There's males and females. The two on the right are unisexual. They're all female. They reproduce by a mechanism called parthenogenesis. Cloning is what that is, basically. Uh, and that's known in one snake and about 70 species of lizards and in no other group of vertebrates. Kind of weird. For this and other reasons, lizards have become model organisms in research. They exemplify a lot of biological properties of general interest, but because they're usually abundant, they're easily accessible in the field, uh, they've been selected for all kinds of investigations. These are the characteristics of a model organism. My own research group uh, participates in, uh, I think, about 11 or 12 lizard projects in eight Latin American countries and one in Africa and Madagascar. I'm not going to go through those, but I do want to point out one feature that's especially interesting in lizards. This looks like a snake. It's not. It's, it's an elongate limb-reduced lizards. If you look about midway back on the body there, maybe you can see a little tiny hind leg sticking out. It's a, it's a reduced leg with two digits. It doesn't function. If you, if you look up behind the head here, and I don't know if you can see this, there's a tiny little forelimb there with one digit. The lizard folds these to the side and moves like a snake. It can't use the limbs for locomotion. And then if we, if we look at this group, this is one genus of Australian skink, and the one in the upper left is a normal lizard. The one in the lower right is completely limbless. And then there's a com almost a complete series of transitions of every imaginable stage in between those two. This group, this, this, the next slide here I'm showing you is a python embryo. Now that's a snake, but you'll see in panel D the development of a pelvic girdle and a femur, long bone of the leg. If you look in panel F, that uh, pancake colored structure is a limb bud. The most primitive living snakes as embryos develop girdles and limbs and then the developmental program stops and the rest of the snake sort of grows around it so you don't see these structures on the outside. But if we take lizards and snakes together, again this is a phylogenetic tree depicting relationships, don't worry about the names, everything bracketed in red on this tree is a, is a group of lizards in which at least some genera and a few species 
exhibit the transition toward limb reduction. Uh, and then over on the right in blue are the snakes. That's where an entire group has completed the transition to an elongate limbless body, okay? The point I want to make here is this whole group offers replicate experiments, if you will think of it this way, uh, in the transition from a normal four-limbed to a reduced-limbed to a limbless condition. And we have the opportunity here to look in several of these lizard groups at the molecular genetics that regulate the developmental program and see if we can establish generalities. And then we can look in the fossil record of snakes and the most snake-like lizards for the transition and just maybe put together a story on how nature comes up with a brand new body plan. And I'm talking about the snakes here. We could probably do this with a few other groups, but as far as I'm concerned, there wouldn't be any anything nearly as exciting as this to explain something like the origin of snakes. These, for whatever reason, these animals captivate us. We often feel maybe fear and fascination at the same time, but in terms of their morphology, adaptation, specializations, they're in a class by themselves. They range in size from worm-like termite specialists to large constrictors that may attain 25, 30 feet in length, be dangerous to humans. All of them have a skeleton specialized for limbless locomotion. A number of, the number of vertebrae may range from 150 to 400, each one with a pair of ribs that's open ventrally. There is no breastbone, there's no fusion of ribs in the midline of the body. And then if you look at the scale patterns, for every pair of ribs, there's a broad transverse ventral scale. And this combination of scalation on the outside, the skeleton, the muscles that I haven't shown you, give them a strength and a suppleness that's not found in any other limbless vertebrate. Some snakes, for example, can climb vertically up a tree trunk without any lateral limbs. If you've ever watched a snake close up, you notice they're constantly flicking the tongue in and out. The tongue is protruded, the tines of the fork are distended, it's waved in the air or touches the substrate, retracted back into the mouth. Uh, and what the snake is doing is picking up volatile chemical compounds on the tongue, pulling it back into the mouth, closing the mouth, and then if you look in this photograph, this drawing, the little red mushroom-shaped body in the side of the head, that's a vomeronasal, or what's sometimes called a Jacobson's organ. It's a paired receptor that specializes in interpreting the volatile compounds the snake has brought in on its tongue. It's not taste, it's not smell, it's a sense we don't use, uh, but it's a way of sort of chemically detecting uh, your immediate surroundings. So they have a, a sensory system that we can't appreciate. There are a few snakes, we call them pit vipers, that have another sense on top of this, and that's the hole in the side of this viper's face just in front of the eye, paired heat-sensitive pits. This is a West Tennessee cottonmouth in defensive posture with the mouth open, gaping. This is a venomous snake, but the fangs remain retracted into the roof of the mouth, and the reason is the snake is looking at me, she can see me, but she's also using these paired thermal receptors to, to size me up. And it's almost like a snake has an infrared image. Even in total darkness, they can form an image by the thermal field detected in the sensory pits. Again, it's a sensory system we don't have and can't appreciate. You all know some snakes are venomous. We can group them by dentition. This is four types of dentition seen in living snakes. The one in the upper left is the harmless category. Everything else with a tooth marked in black there is venomous at some level. The one in the upper right are the snakes that are called rear fanged, the fangs back in the mouth. The lower left are the, the cobras and sea snakes, things that have a front fang that's small and permanently erect. And then the lower right here, the specialized vipers and pit vipers with the real large fang that is retractile. This is a skull of a pit viper showing that real big tooth, the fang, on a bone that can be rotated back and forth in the mouth. The venom gland anatomy would look something like this. It's a specialized salivary gland below the eye and back of the eye with a duct that runs forward over the maxillary bone, feeds into a canal at the top of the fang. The fang itself is hollow like a hypodermic needle with an opening at the bottom. And when a snake strikes, it can voluntarily express venom or not, depending on the purpose of the strike. When a snake is feeding, when the strike is a feeding strike, the fangs are protracted out of the mouth, jab into the prey, venom is expressed, and the snake can meter the venom based on the size of the prey item. Release, retract, prey item is paralyzed, it runs off and dies, the snake follows it, tracks it down and eats it. 
Um, for venoms that are hemolytic, venoms that, do, that destroy tissue, the function here is not only to kill the prey, but to begin prey digestion. This is a antelope ground squirrel dissected out of a great basin rattlesnake. This is a common snake here along the Wasatch Front. Uh, and, the, and the snake can take very large prey items relative to its body size because the venom that it uses to kill the prey begins to digest the prey from the inside out before the snake ever even swallows the prey. By the time the prey gets in the stomach, it's being digested from the outside in by the snake's digestive enzymes and from the inside out by the venom. For comparison, here's another common Great Basin Wasatch Front snake that's also a rodent eater. This is a gopher snake, which is not venomous, and it also feeds on rodents, but it has to take prey items relatively small proportional to its body size. It doesn't have the venom thing. It can't digest the prey just by biting it and letting it run off. So there's, a, there's kind of an ecological lesson here. There's two common predators in the desert feeding on the same prey base, but partitioning the prey by body size as a function of the presence of venom in one predator and the absence of venom in the other. Two other things about snakes uh, that are put them in a league of their own. One is this business of swallowing large prey items. It's not uncommon for a snake to swallow something three to four times the diameter of its head. This is a skeleton of a boa, and the easiest way for me to illustrate that is to clasp my hands together, and if you can imagine my wrist here being the lower jaw, the two halves of our jaw are fused at the chin, and we chew, we bite like this. The maximum diameter of anything we want to swallow is fixed by the distance between my elbows, the distance between your jaw. You're not going to get anything down larger than that diameter. Well, snakes do a whole lot of things to make the skull more kinetic, but one is they do away with this fusion at the chin, so their lower jaw can stretch laterally on two ligaments. And then if you imagine my upper arms or some of the skull bones illustrated here, again, in us and most other vertebrates, they're fused solid. Snakes can do this but the mobility in these other skull bones allows them to do this. So the gape all of a sudden becomes three to four times the diameter of the head, and they can literally work the jaws around a very large prey item. This is a photograph taken out of a book, but it's an African python swallowing an antelope. Um, it may take two or three hours to get down a meal that size. The windpipe in the snake can slide to either side of the mouth and be protruded forward a little bit so they can keep breathing while they're doing all this. And when I say big, let me give you a few numbers. It's not uncommon for a snake to ingest a prey item about 25% of its body weight. For a 140 pound person, that's a 35 pound meal, okay? You think a 16 ounce sirloin is a big meal, try a 35 pound piece of meat, okay? Uh, the trade-off is you don't have to eat very often if you eat like that. You can go weeks, months, sometimes a year or two between meals, but it's hard on the digestive tract. What it means is that 99% of the time your digestive tract has nothing to do, and then at unpredictable intervals you get this massive amount of food all at once. Um, this graph shows sort of what happens uh, when snakes take on a big meal. The horizontal axis is the number of days after feeding. The vertical axis is the amount of new tissue laid down in the first 24 or 36 hours, and this happens to be small intestines, but the snakes do this with six or seven body organs. They ingest a big meal, they have to ramp up the digestive system and borrow ahead on the calories that they will eventually get from the big meal. Again, to put this into the perspective of a 140 pound person, you eat a big meal or an average meal, 30 or 40 pounds in one sitting. In the first 24 hours, you lay down six pounds of new small intestine just to get ready. You enlarge the liver, the kidneys, a whole lot of other structures the same way. Uh, in, in species such as ourselves, we eat a big meal. Our O2 consumption may go up 20 or 25 percent. With a snake, it goes up 3,600 percent. We double our enzyme production after a big meal. In snakes, it increases 60-fold. So you get the idea. They're kind of in a class of their own, and this has made them, again, model systems. They exhibit all the properties of digestion that we do and all other vertebrates, but in a magnified sense. 
If, I don't know if you can read the address of the authors here, but they're, they're at the UCLA Medical School. A lot of research on digestive physiology is now focused on pythons because they're model systems. Um, that's been a real quick overview. In the few minutes I have left, we can't all be herpetologists and be paid for our hobby. Uh, most of us has to, have to do other things. What I want to do is try to tie uh, a few of the themes here back to broader themes that I think I hope will interest all of you and, and show you maybe a deeper relevance to humanity. Um, the branch of biology that deals with species on Earth is systematic biology. We have a term for the Earth species. We call that biodiversity. That's a conjunction of two words, biological diversity, and what I'm referring to here is all of the native plants and animals in the world. We don't know how many there are. Uh, there is a research agenda that was set out 2,000 years ago to find this out. Very simple questions. How many are there? Where do they occur? Et cetera, et cetera. It sounds easy. We have named, we, science has named 1.7 million species. Insects, bacteria, plants, animals, everything. The estimates of what we think is really out there range from 5 to 100 million. So we don't really even know within an order of magnitude how close we are to the total. We just know the number we know about is a drastic underestimate of what's really out there. Look at number three here, their properties. This becomes interesting because we can capitalize on a lot of the properties of other species. I'll use two examples from amphibians, the group I've neglected up to now. Salamanders are the only vertebrates that can completely regenerate an amputated limb. They appear to do this by reprogramming the cells at the amputation site, grow a new limb. As far as we can tell, mammal cells, human cells, should have the same flexibility if we've got the developmental program, it just means ours is switched off. We don't know where the switch is, but if we can find that and flip it back on, you can imagine the medical benefits from learning how to regenerate limbs. The dark poison frogs of Central and South America sequester in their skins all kinds of compounds that have captured the interest of the medical and pharmaceutical industries. One, for example, one compound described two years ago in a frog from Ecuador, is more effective than morphine as a painkiller by about 200-fold and has none of the addictive side effects. These are just two examples. What I'm driving at here uh, is one of four arguments that have been used to justify concern over and conservation of the planet's biodiversity. The first two are direct economic concerns, economic benefits like the two I just mentioned, indirect economic benefits. It's as if we have been given custody of a biological heritage that we don't know, we don't even know what it is, and we can, we can use the analogy of a genetic savings account. The species represent the capital of the account. All indications are that current human activity is accelerating extinction rates. Extinction eats into the capital. There's a couple of other justifications here, cultural, aesthetic, the bottom one, ethical, moral, spiritual. That's the one I want to close on. Extinction is not like any other environmental problem. We can dirty a lake and we can clean it up. We can dirty the air, we can clean it up. We can't bring back species that we have pushed over the brink of extinction. It represents what ethicists have called a kind of super killing, the death of birth, because it shuts down nature's regenerative processes. Uh, this puts us in a, in a bit of a dilemma. The 800 million poorest people in the world live in the biologically richest parts of the world. And we can't ask uh, that environmental justice trump social justice or economic equity, but what we can do is make sure that they all go para in parallel. It will take the utmost stewardship we can muster to improve people's lives in the poorest parts of the world and hang on to as much of our genetic savings account as is possible. There are signs we're getting a grip on the problem. In the United States, for example, the Nature Conservancy published this review two years ago of the status of biodiversity in the United States. We, can, we have the knowledge or we can get the knowledge to tackle these problems. We have or can motivate the resources if we want to. What I'm not sure we have is a unified will or vision to imagine doing things a little bit differently than the way we've always done them. That's really what it'll take. And let me close with um, a picture of Real Foot Lake in West Tennessee. This is a place that's special to me. My dad took me here when I was maybe eight or nine years old. 
All of the common species at Real Foot Lake had been named and described a century and a half before I got there, but they were all new to me. I had never seen a place like this. My, I was captivated. My imagination knew lo, no limits. This, this literally was the Amazon of my youth. The point I want to make here is that the sense of wonder is something we all have or used to have. Every child is curious about everything. And as we get older, we, we tend to lose touch. We tend to lose some of that sense of wonder. It's like any other mental faculty. It has to be nurtured and cultivated. And we either get removed from nature or we acquire unnecessary fears and prejudices that we carry around like excess baggage. Gentle teaching and the patience of a good mentor can strip away the fears and the prejudices. And if we can reconnect with, uh, with this wonder of our childhood that we all had at one time, the, the political will will be there. It will assemble on its own and we can make the right ethical choices. Thank you.